Ian, thanks for coming. Thanks for having me. <laughs> <laughs> um, I've had that you played in your first time in the game of Turkey. Are you a natural talent or how it came? I don't know really. Um, I remember why I started playing music in any way, and that was around, uh, must have been like 74. Uh, my brother had an album with uh, Deep Purple, um, Machine Head, with Smoke on the Water and uh, Highway Star and those songs, and I, I really liked the energy of, the, of, of rock and roll music. Um, but it wasn't until 76 that I heard an album by Rainbow, called Rainbow Rising. And the drummer uh, in that band, on that album, uh, was Cozy Powell, a very good British uh, hard rock drummer. And he played, on one track, he played with double bass drums. It was really energetic. So that was actually the, the, the moment when I decided, this is what I want to do. I want to be, be part of this energy flow. So, um, and then I got my first drum kit like a year later, and I was sitting, you know, with my headphones playing drums and trying to figure out what the drummer was doing and stuff like that. So, um, yeah, I, that, that was the way it, it, wor it worked for me. And uh, you learned it by all, all by yourself? Yeah, most of it. Um, I took some lessons from from a drum teacher for a while, but I would say I'm a um, to 95 percent, you know, self-taught. So, yeah. Okay. Uh, who are your early heroes? Um, your inspiration? My early heroes are, uh, apart from um, Cozy Powell, uh, I have to say my parents, who actually believed in me and, you know, uh, you know, let me um, practice. I, I can imagine it must have been uh, one hell of a noise <laughs> back home when I was sitting there playing. Sure. So uh, those are my heroes, my parents, mm -hmm. Cozy Powell, mm -hmm. and other drummers, um, Ian Pace from Deep Purple and um, John Longham from Led Zeppelin. I, I, I think those drummers are the ones that affect you. Later you joined Europe, mm -hmm. you plenty and you had huge success with the final countdown. Yeah. Um, how did you deal with that success? Well, I don't think we actually did the deal with it. No, but it happened so fast. I remember we came to Japan to do a tour, and this was before uh, the big hysteria thing happened. Um, a record company called us up while we were in Japan touring, and they said that some, um, I think it was a Dutch radio station, had started to play the, the Final Countdown on, on radio, and that they had a lot of uh, positive reactions from, from the listeners. So, and then, during the, the, the following three or four months, it just exploded all over Europe. Uh, the final countdown became number one in, I think, like 25 countries all over the world, you know, and, and it was a real huge hit. And it happened so fast that we, I don't think we really had time to understand what, what happened. You know? It was just like, a, you know, riding a Ferrari, you know, on the, on the highway in 200 kilometers an hour, you know, we, we, uh, we just, you know, try to hold on, really. Do you have a favorite moment back then, a favorite memory? Yeah, I think um, one of the, the, the highlights that I can remember is that when, when the final count on, uh, became number one in England, the UK is always a very prestigious market, you know, um, so that was one of the, one of the, moments that was really like wow we, we made it and also when we uh, uh, when we did um, some of the shows we did like when we played together with Bon Jovi at the Milton Keynes a huge outdoor festival like 70,000 people and it was Europe Bon Jovi Skid Row and some other bands and it was really like one of those moments when when you feel that shit this is this is big this is big and we're we're part of it um yeah I, I you know some things like that any negative experience with the success the negative experience i would say is that you sort of lose uh, contact with reality you know it's um when you go on tour back in those days it was to me it was like entering the twilight zone <laughs> 
no rules supplied. You know, you could do whatever you wanted to, and then when you got back home, you sort of went into reality again. So, uh, I mean, we, I did a lot of uh, stupid things, um, you know, uh, cheating on my girlfriend and stuff like that, and I didn't really realize while it was happening that it was like hurtful for her. It wasn't until after the tour that I, you know, it really struck me. So I think those are probably the most, the baddest, uh, the baddest experiences um, that I didn't really understand what I was doing. So I just lived the life that felt right at the moment. You know, it, so that's, you know, it takes takes a while to understand what you're doing. So it's, it's basically that, or, or maybe some of the uh, business moves we did with uh, bad contracts that we signed and some, some uh, record company uh, bullshit that we had to deal with. Also that, I think, I guess you tend to, to remember the good things. I mean, the bad things you just, well, so. Getting back to yeah. How does it feel to play again? It's amazing, you know, we we did the whole reunion thing started off when we did the, the Mill uh, Millennium show in Stockholm. We played uh, Rock the Night, the Final Countdown, and we played between the millenniums. So we started in the 1900s, and we ended in the 2000s. So I think it was a big honor for us to, to do that and to play the Final Countdown. It was like and the audience, it, it was an outdoor show and people were spread out all over Stockholm city. And they had like video screens everywhere in the city. And I heard something that it was about a million, a million people in, in the city. So we had by far the largest audience playing. Um, so it was, uh, it was really big. It was like the only people before us that really experienced a new millennium was I mean, it's like Jesus, uh, the Vikings, and us in Europe, you know. So uh, it was it was a big moment, and I think it was during the rehearsals of that show we spent like two days just going through the songs, the days between Christmas and New Year's Eve, and we got that was the first time we got together and played uh, for uh, you know 10, 12 years, and especially with John Norum because John Norum left the band in 1987. And uh, so this was the first time we, we played together for that long time. And I think we all just experienced that the magic and the, the chemistry within the band and between the different uh, members were still there. And we had a good time, we laughed and we, you know, you know it's not like uh, we'd been away for five, uh, five minutes, you know. So um, then after that it took uh, another two or three years before uh, we started you know really planning for for full uh, combat uh, thing so we um, I don't know it, it felt natural it, when, when we gave up in, in uh, the early 90s playing it just felt like we, we uh, there were more to give you know we, we didn't finish for for uh, made a final finish it, it was a it was a lunch break so <laughs> so it, fe it feels great and it's amazing that we're still able to do this like 15 years later after we stopped playing and um, but the funny thing is I don't think there's been one single day uh, during that uh, down period in the 90s that somebody came up to me and asked me so when are you guys going to reform mm. so it, you know after a couple of years I just you know you just understand that okay there is something about this band that touches people you know so it's uh, yeah it, it, it's, it's amazing <laughs>